This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Israeli officials have told Reuters news agency that Israel would have no objection to Syria taking part in a U.S.-sponsored Middle East peace conference later this year. The comments come after U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice signaled that Syria and other Arab states will be invited to take part. The peace-sponsoring bloc that includes the U.S., the U.N., the E.U. and Russia met in New York and said it will work for a successful international meeting. Rice signaled she wanted all Middle East nations with an interest in peace to attend. All of the members of the uh, Arab follow-up committee, um, uh, we believe, would be natural invitees uh, for this uh, meeting. Uh, it is extremely important, though, to note that the, the purpose of this meeting in supporting the Israelis and the Palestinians has to be a commitment to actually supporting a two-state solution. George Jabour is a leading member of the Syrian Ba'ath Party and was an advisor to the late President Hafez al-Assad. He says Syria's interest in attending the meeting, however, it's after substantial talks. Well, I suppose the terms of reference of the peace meeting are still very vague. Uh, what we need is a real commitment from the United States that the conference will not be a tea party, will not be a photo opportunity. It will be a, a conference for peace. It will be a conference to persuade Israel to abide by international law, which uh, obliges Israel to withdraw from the, all the territories occupied in 1967. Iran does not need a nuclear bomb, the message from President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad for American television viewers as he arrived in the United States this week's, uh, ahead of this week's UN General Assembly meeting. But the Iranian leader says sanctions will not slow his country's uranium enrichment program, which he insists will be used to generate nuclear power. Ayman Mohyaddin reports. When Iran's president visits the U.S., the visit alone makes news. But when he denies Iran is pursuing a nuclear bomb and is not heading to war with the West, it's even bigger news. In an interview with the American news company CBS just before he flew to New York, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said that nuclear weapons could no longer provide security to nations who have them, and when asked if his country is pursuing them, he answered firmly. It is a firm no. The nuclear bomb is of no use. If it was useful, it would have prevented the downfall of the Soviet Union. If it was useful, it would have resolved the problems they ha the Americans have in Iraq. And while analysts, pundits, and even government officials around the world debate whether war with Iran is imminent, Iran's president assured war was not on the horizon. Well, it's wrong to think that Iran and the U.S. are walking towards war. Who says so? Why should we go to war? There is no war in the offing again. This is psychological warfare. If you have differences of opinion, you can use logic to resolve your differences. It's a message the president is expected to make on more than one occasion during his trip in the U.S. First stop will be at Columbia University, where despite public protests, Ahmadinejad was asked to address the university, as long as he agreed to take questions from the students. And they're making the same mistake now. One other place President Ahmadinejad was hoping to visit, the site of the World Trade Center attacks. That was ruled out by local New York officials for security reasons. Later in the week, President Ahmadinejad will be able to deliver his message directly to world leaders at the UN General Assembly. Ayman Mohideen, Al Jazeera.
President Ahmadinejad went to the Columbia University in the New York City to say that the misuse of science by colonial powers has backfired as chemical, atomic and biological weapons are wrongly used in the world. On Palestine, the President said Palestinians need to be allowed to hold a referendum to decide their own future, adding no one should be given the green light to spend millions of dollars to arm one of the parties involved in the conflict. Rejecting allegations against Iran, President Ahmadinejad said Tehran sees no reason to resort to terrorism because the Iranian nation itself is a victim of acts of terror. At the end of his speech, the Iranian president attended a Q&A session. Earlier, he talked to the Washington-based U.S. National Press Club in a video conference, but he said his remarks on Iraq have been distorted by the Western media. President Ahmadinejad went on to say he had stated that in case of the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq, regional countries such as Iran and Saudi Arabia will be capable of filling the power vacuum and maintain security in the region. Also in an interview with the Associated Press, the Iranian president noted that Tehran has always maintained a defensive policy. He, ha he added he did not believe that the U.S. is preparing for war on Iran. Iran will not attack any country. I believe that some of the talk in this regard, first of all, arises from anger. درسانی کاربرد انتخاباتی داخل آمریکا داره. And secondly, it serves the electoral purposes um, domestically within this country. و سال سان سرپوش گذاشتن بر شکست‌های متوالی از ناحیه سیاست‌های غلط در عراق. And third, it serves as a cover-up on continued policy failures over Iraq. ما فکر می‌کنیم یک اشتباه رو با اشتباه دیگر نمی‌توان جبران کرد. We don't think that you can compensate for one mistake by committing more mistakes. Within the next few hours, Lebanon will launch its scheduled presidential election along with its embedded political and security concerns. The Lebanese defense minister announced that the parliament's area will be treated as a military zone. It is almost certain that tomorrow's session will not have the majority of votes needed to elect a new president. There is hope, however, that the session will open up doors for negotiations and expedite the internal dialogue. Our correspondent Ali Ibrahim gives us details on the political and security scene the night before the presidential elections. Lebanon enters its scheduled presidential election in the next few hours amid complicated political and security measures and never-ending constitutional debates. After the recent assassination of the parliamentarian Antoine Ghanem and as the March 14th alliance revealed a plot set to assassinate four of their members to rid them of the majority in the parliament, the safety of the parliament members became the main concern. Defense Minister Elias Almor announced that the army will take the responsibility of securing the safety of the parliament members and that the surrounding area of the parliament will be considered a military zone. Technically, it is almost certain that this first session will not produce a new president but will instead open the door for negotiations and internal dialogue. We are going to Tuesday's session in the Lebanese parliament with a negotiating spirit in the hopes of reaching an agreement. We are going to open the door for a solution. Meanwhile, the opposition stands firm on boycotting the session unless an agreement is reached in advance regarding the presidential candidate and his or her agenda. Any move that does not entail a full agreement and that does not support the two-third voting process is considered a move against our coexistence, which is an essential part of the Lebanese constitution. Meanwhile, it has been rumored that Arab leaders have called Speaker of the House Nabiya Bedi and asked him to interfere to remove the demonstration tents located near the parliament. However, no developments in that regard have been reported. The two-month time frame to elect a new president has begun and the political deadlock that came with the resignation of of the parliament members from the opposition is nearing its end. There are now two possible outcomes, either a final solution or further division. Ali Ibrahim, Dubai TV, from in front of the Lebanese parliament, Beirut.
Pakistan's Supreme Court has postponed until Tuesday a hearing to review a request filed by the opposition against General Pervez Musharraf, who was nominated to run for another term as the country's president and the head of its army. Meanwhile, the opposition was unable to organize large protests due to heightened security measures around the Supreme Court compound. In addition, the Pakistani authority continues to carry out sweeps, including the arrests of hundreds of activists from the opposition. This is how the scene looked today in front of Pakistan's Supreme Court compound, where some opposition lawyers attempted to paint in black the faces of lawyers representing President Musharraf. Meanwhile, the Pakistani government condemned this type of behavior. What I did was not a big deal. It was only the first drops of the rain. I plead to the civic society and all political leaders to paint in black the faces of those disgracing our nation through their words and and actions. We strongly condemn what happened to Mr. Kasuri. This violates the lawyer's codes of ethics. Kasuri is a professional lawyer who was just doing his job, and those who committed the offense will suffer the consequences. Dozens of protesters who were able to infiltrate into the vicinity of the court repeated anti-Musharraf slogans. Meanwhile, the Pakistani authority continues to carry out sweeps in Islamabad where the opposition confirmed that hundreds of their activists and supporters have been arrested. The court, which was expected to be packed with protesters against Musharraf, witnessed a heavy security and police presence. Meanwhile, the opposition nominated a retired judge to compete against Musharraf in the presidential elections. It also stressed that it's illegal for Musharraf to run for another presidential term. We have just announced, that just we have just announced the nomination of retired judge Waji Dean Ahmad, a prominent judge in the former Sindh region. Ahmad will compete against General Musharraf in the presidential elections, and we are confident that he will be accepted as an independent candidate. Some believe that the heightened security measures will hamper the efforts of the Alliance of Pakistani Democratic Movements and Parties and foil its plans to adopt a unified position against Musharraf. Too much pressure will lead to an explosion, however, not in the opposition's case. While the Pakistani opposition continues to face a growing pressure, it is more determined than ever to bring down the government. Ahmad Barakat, Al Jazeera, Islamabad. The sheikhs and tribal leaders of Baghdad and its surrounding areas demanded financial and military support from their government to fight al-Qaeda. Meanwhile, Vice President Tariq al-Hashimi reiterated that the administration must be built on a consensus of agreements with no winners and no losers. Majid Hamid has this report. During his meeting with the sheikhs and the tribal leaders of Baghdad and its surrounding areas, Iraq's Vice President Tariq al-Hashmi reiterated the importance of the tribe's role in restoring security to Iraq. He asked Maliki's administration to provide them with full support, adding that the political game in Iraq should not produce any winners or losers. According to the adopted security plan, the enlisting of your sons and daughters in the police force is essential in order for you to take charge of your areas. As a response to Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki's speech in New York, during which he announced that he will be appointing ministers from the Anbar Awakening Council to replace the two resigned ministers, Hashimi had the following to say. Let the world hear this. We reject any patronizing, and we reject this proposal. The Iraqi Alliance Front will not return until all agreements have been restored and assurances have been given regarding promises made. Meanwhile, Iraqi tribal leaders in northern, southern and western Baghdad said that they are able to fight the armed groups and defend their territories, provided that the Iraqi government delivers on its promises and supports them militarily and financially. The government must support our efforts symbolically and financially. It must also supply us with weapons and military equipment. Five months have passed since this area was liberated. However, we haven't received help from anyone.
Some observers believe that this conference comes in the context of the ongoing efforts exerted by the Iraqi Accordance Front, which is trying to rally public support. This news comes after Al Hashimi visited several Iraqi provinces, including Al Anbar, Diyala, and Salah al-Din. According to information leaked from the Anbar Awakening Council, the Iraqi Prime Minister Nur al Maliki has met a delegation from the Anbar Salvation Council led by Hamid al Hayez. Al Hayez presented to Al Maliki the names of 10 candidates to replace the withdrawing representatives of the Iraqi Accordance Front. From the headquarters compound of the Islamic Party in Baghdad, Majid Hamid Al Arabiya. On the ground, an Iraqi official confirmed that six people, including three security officers, were killed and more than 17 others were wounded in a booby trapped truck in the town of Tal Afar along the Iraqi Syrian borders. The NATO forces in northern Afghanistan announced that two civilians were killed during an air raid against the Taliban in Yershak, located in the southern state of Helmand. Two NATO soldiers were also killed. A French soldier was killed when his vehicle exploded by a roadside bomb, and a Dutch soldier was killed during an attack on the Dutch military base. A booby-trapped vehicle exploded in western Kabul, causing a strong explosion. The target of the military operation was an International Security Assistance Force NATO unit. The explosion killed one French soldier in Kabul. The head of a police criminal investigation unit in Afghanistan, Ali Shah Bakhtaval, said that the explosion was caused by a booby-trapped vehicle. The target of the explosion was a Western convoy, but we saw some Afghans that were injured too. We were not allowed to go to the site of the explosion. Bakhtaval's statements were confirmed by the ISAF spokesman, Major Charles Anthony, who said that a booby-trapped vehicle exploded near an ISAF convoy. However, a French official from ISAF refused to confirm this information. The suicide bomber who was driving the booby-trapped vehicle was killed. Three cars were damaged and three civilians were severely injured. Coincidentally, the explosion happened as a convoy of buses transporting civilians was passing by. One bus burned while another was severely damaged and seven passengers were critically injured. NATO announced that it has killed 40 Taliban fighters in the Helmand region located in southern Afghanistan. This comes after NATO announced that six civilians were killed during an air raid against Taliban fighters in the southern part of the country. ISAF issued a statement saying that a number of non-combatant civilians were killed during the raid in Gershak Valley in Helmand. The raid was ordered after several hours of fighting, during which 75 Taliban Taliban fighters were killed. One Dutch soldier from the ISAF was killed on Thursday when his unit was attacked by mortar shells in southern Afghanistan. Throughout history, different empires have had their eyes on Africa. Today, however, the people of Africa will decide which state will be allowed to return to their continent. Once again, Africa is a focal point for the superpowers and the greedy corporations. African-led revolutions forced the colonizers out of Africa, but now they want to come back under the umbrella of globalization. It seems that the U.S. wants to destabilize the continent and diminish the role of the French have there which explains why the U.S. was responsible for many of the incidents that were aimed at creating crises in Africa. France returned to the continent when President Nicolas Sarkozy recently visited Libya. Sarkozy views Libya 
as the gate to Africa, which explains why he made his historic visit to Tripoli, Libya. During his visit, economic and military agreements were reached with Tripoli, which made Washington nervous. This comes after Bush's decision to end the sanctions imposed on Libya, and as he has expressed interest in resuming good relations with Libya. David Welch, the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, also visited Libya just before Rice arrived there. Rice wanted to steal the spotlight from Sarkozy, but she has been seen unsuccessful since the U.S. is still treating Africa as a colony. African leaders are insisting that their continent must be respected and treated as an equal. Sarkozy has proven that France will treat Africa as their equal. France and the U.S. both want to expand their influence in Africa, but which country will be more successful in doing so? There's a clear difference in the way both countries view Africa. Washington views Africa as a colony, or rather as its African backyard, especially after it lost its Latin backyard. Paris, on the other hand, wants to establish partnerships without taking advantage of the former colonies. Topping today's newscast, the Attorney General announced this afternoon that he is launching a second criminal investigation against Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. Olmert will be investigated on suspicion that he bought an apartment on Jerusalem's Kremu Street for a greatly reduced price. The suspicions were originally raised by State Comptroller Michael Lindenstrauss. Attorney General Menachem Mazuz has now ordered the police to find out whether Olmert, in return for the generous discount, promised the contractor to use his influence to speed up the granting of building rights on the property. Police are already probing other suspicions of corruption against the Prime Minister, involving the sale of controlling shares in Bank Lumi while Omer served as Finance Minister. Hours before the announcement by the Attorney General, Prime Minister Omer briefed the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee this morning. Omer told MKs that he did not expect Israel to reach a final status agreement with the Palestinians for another 20 or 30 years but stressed that it would involve a wide-scale Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank. Turning to the upcoming Washington Peace Conference, Omert said that refusing to talk to the Palestinians would mean an endless cycle of violence, and that if Israel won't talk with Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas and PA Prime Minister Salam Fayyad, it won't find any other partner. Opposition leader Benjamin Netanyahu rejected Omert's statements, telling him, you're the only one who genuinely thinks that Abbas is a partner who can keep Israel safe. November is uh, still ahead of us. We have six weeks of uh, dialogue between the Prime Minister's team and the Palestinians. I cannot tell you uh, what will happen because this is still uh, vague. But Israel's uh, commitment to uh, isolate the extreme camp and to open uh, sincere and profound dialogue with the moderate pragmatic camp is essential and we have to go forward with our commitment. We have a partner. This is an opportunity, very unique opportunity. It will be silly if we miss this opportunity and it will be very dangerous if this international uh, conference is going to fail. We should do whatever we can in order to prevent any collapse of the peace process because it means deterioration of the process, it means violence, it means the strengthening of Hamas. In the city of Ma'an, Ramadan has a special flavor with colorful markets and iftar meals, meals to break the fast, for the poor and the needy, emphasizing the importance of social solidarity. The value of forgiveness, social solidarity and connectedness are embodied in Ma'an, reflecting the extent of compassion, love and harmony. In this blessed month, God commanded fasting as a way for people to ask for forgiveness, to learn and to avoid punishment. This is in addition to fulfilling their duties of prayer, worship and reading the Quran. Relationships and social ties are emphasized during the month of Ramadan, with importance being placed on taking care of one's relatives and helping those in need. 
The generosity that is instilled in our hearts is alive among the people of Ma'an. The evidence is in El Sabil tents, which are sponsored by His Royal Highness. May God give him long life. Ramadan in Ma'an is characterized by markets stocking their stands with fruits, vegetables, desserts, and dates. In addition, there is also Bayt al-Sabil Ma'an, which offers Ramadan meals to visitors, including students and those in need. Thank God we are well and our country is well. Sure, there is a noticeable rise in the prices of some merchandise, but it is due to the global rise in the prices of the primary commodities, not to mention inflation and the fluctuations in the money market, which directly affect exports into Jordan. Embodying solidarity and goodwill, the Orphans' Organization of Ma'an is providing meals to orphans for the whole month of Ramadan. Learning from His Highness King Abdullah II about solidarity and attentiveness to the needy, the governor of Ma'an, Abdel Fattah al maita joined these orphans for their iftar meal so that they did not feel needy in this blessed month. I am very happy to be with our orphans' children who have gathered at this hour to have their iftar meal. Of course, this is not new to us in Jordan. We follow the direction of King Abdallah. God give him long life, who is the first to do kind deeds. We simply translate his words in the field. This is Ramadan in Ma'an, colored by social solidarity, compassion, love, and good deeds, as well as the Ramadan meals offered throughout the district, and the image speaks louder than words. Ra'id Aujan, Jordan TV, Ma'an District. Hi, I'm Wendy Hanamura, the station manager here at Link TV, and I'm here to talk to you about something very important. Keeping this show that you're watching, Mosaic, on the air. Now, Mosaic has always enjoyed foundation support, but that foundation support is now over. And we need to raise $200,000 in the next few months to keep this vital program on the air through 2007. So please do your part right now. Go online to linktv.org or give us a call at 1-866-485-8848. That's 1-866-485-8848. Give as generously as you can, please. Why? Because information is power. Information is the lifeblood of a democracy. You know, it's kind of staggering to think that we are now entering the fifth year of this war in Iraq. We've been in Iraq longer than we fought World War II. Mosaic is a window. It's a window into what's happening on the ground in the Middle East. It's a window you wouldn't have if it wasn't on Link TV. I believe that we need Mosaic. If every person in this country watched Mosaic every day, including those people in the White House, how would we make our decisions? How would it alter our destiny? It's an important question. And at a time when the military filters so much of the information about the war, when the corporate media controls so much of what you see, hear, and read, independent media has never been more important. Independent, nonprofit mosaic has never been more important. So please do whatever you can, give as much as you can. Consider this a $400 donation right now pays for one broadcast of this vital program. Information is power, and now you have the power to keep this program on the air. Thank you. Mosaic needs your support. Help us reach our goal to raise $200,000 by the end of the year to keep Mosaic on the air. Pledge your gift today at 1-866-485-8848 or linktv.org. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic Video Podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic 
is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.